Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the press, uh, Mrs. Lord Mayor, thank you for that introduction. I, I must tell you, I am overwhelmed at the reception that we have received for our accomplishment in crossing the Atlantic yesterday. And I say our accomplishment because uh, it seems that all of the attention is being paid to me as the first woman to have crossed. But in reality, I didn't fly. I was merely baggage on that flight yesterday. Um, I must give credit where it is due, and that goes to Captain Stultz and Captain Gordon. I, I am a trained pilot. I'm very experienced. I have 500 hours of flying time, and I was the captain of this flight, but I am not trained on instruments. And as you know, the weather yesterday was terrible, and it was all the way from America. And since I'm not trained to fly by instruments, Captain Stoltz was the only one of the three of us. So he flew the entire way, and you know, I was merely a passenger. But I hope in future to do the same myself and to earn my, my accolades more honestly than I seem to have <laughs> this time. Um, I've been told that you want to know a bit about me. And there's nothing much to tell, I'm afraid. I'm a social worker. I work at Denison House in Boston. I play with the children of Chinese and Syrian immigrants. Are you from Boston? I'm not originally from Boston, no. no. Where are you from? Well, <laughs> from a great many places. In fact, I was born and raised in Atchison, Kansas till I was 12, and then we moved to uh, Des Moines. And to Los Angeles and to Chicago. And how do your parents feel about you being a woman in farm? Beg your pardon? How do, you, how do your parents feel about you being a woman in farm? I think they are now resigned to it. Um, they fought it very much in the beginning. I, well, let me tell you how I came to flying because that is part of the story. And then I'll tell you my parents' reaction to it. I, I had never thought of flying myself until we was in the middle of the Great War. I think it was 1917. I was going to school in New York, and my sister was in school in Toronto, and so I went to visit her in Toronto, and she was a nurse, and we were walking down the street. Now, the United States, um, we hadn't felt the brunt of the war yet, and I'd been knitting hats and things for the, for the soldiers, but I thought I was doing my part. But then on the streets of Toronto, four men came towards my sister and me, all four of them on crutches, each one of them missing a leg. And I realized at that point I was doing nothing for the war ever. So I quit school and I became a nurse. And uh, as a nurse, I, I worked in a ward with men who had had chest injuries, but a great many of them were flyers. And they took my sister and me out to the field and we watched them fly and I still had no idea that I would end up becoming a pilot. Um, but I was fascinated by it and I, and I must admit there was a... It was fear mingled with excitement when the pilots would buzz the landing field just inches from our heads it felt as though they were. So when we moved to California, um, my father took me, I was 23 at the time, my father took me to see an air show at uh, Kenner Field. And I asked him to find out how much flying lessons cost. And he made me talk with the man. I, I didn't want to ask myself, I was afraid they'd laugh at me. And um, so that night over the dinner table, he told my mother that I had asked to find out how much lessons cost. And, and I said very casually, oh, I think I might like to take up flying. But in reality, I knew if I did not fly, I would die. <laughs> and uh, I began taking lessons right away. And my parents were terribly opposed to it, to my mother in particular. But I applied myself so much to it, I think, that finally she resigned herself. And in fact, my mother, two years later, bought me my first airplane. So I think it still terrifies my entire family. But I think they also know by now that... So you come from a wealthy family, can they, they can afford airplanes? <laughs> I wouldn't say they're a wealthy family, no. Uh, my grandparents were wealthy in Atchison. Uh, my 
father was a lawyer, but worked for the railroads, and things didn't go well for him in the railroads, unfortunately. So, no, we weren't wealthy at all. Um, I was first loaned the air, the Bert Kenner, who loaned the airfield, first loaned me the plane, and uh, it's one that he designed and built, the Kenner Airster. And he allowed me first to own it as my own if I would use it um, for publicity for him to bring more people to his airfield and to sell his airplanes. And um, my mother received a small inheritance and used part of it to buy that plane. Uh, but we still didn't have the money to house it or to maintain it. And, and Mr. Kenner allowed me to keep it there at Kenner Field um, and to maintain it on his property as long as I would continue to advertise for him. So, no, I wouldn't say we were wealthy, but I think it was important enough to me that my mother realized I must have that airplane or I would never be happy. Um, and unfortunately, the airplane, um, I called it my canary. <laughs> I painted it yellow, my little Kenner canary. And it had a, one of the valves constantly stuck. Um, I had to make several emergency landings and it. it wasn't the most reliable plane. And I sold it to a man who was, um, he was just learning to fly. He was not, he was not as accomplished, perhaps, as he should have been. And on his very first flight, taking a friend with him, um, he crashed the canary and they were both killed. So mm -hmm. that gives me pause, makes me wish I had sold it to someone else, I suppose. But, um, I know some of you are probably thinking you could never fly. People will say to me, I'm afraid of heights, I could never fly. But it's not like being on a roller coaster or, it's much smoother, it's more like being on a ship. The air moves in waves, like water does. And so, for the most part, it's a very placid, peaceful feeling and, and every now and again, you hit ripples in the air currents and it bounces the way a boat would bounce. Um, but for the most part, it's a very peaceful feeling to fly. And there's, there's no feeling of being high in the air. Imagine standing on the edge of a cliff or on the edge of a tall building. It's a terrifying experience even to think about because you can see from your feet down to the ground far, far below the building or the cliff visually connects the two and so you can tell that it's a great distance. But somehow when there's no visual connection, when you're flying, the earth below simply flattens out and you have no perception of height because there aren't, there aren't visual cues to tell you that you're in the air. And nor are there visual cues to tell you how fast you're going. There are no milestones in the air. And so you may be hurtling along at breakneck speed and, and not feel like you are. It's not frightening at all. And I, and I would hope, I know that, that some of you Ladies may write for ladies' magazines, and I hope that you would encourage ladies to try this mode of transportation. It's, it is still dangerous now for those of us who are trying to break records. But for normal transportation over land, where there is plenty of fuel, um, well, the more farmers we can get to, to paint their coordinates on their barn roofs, the safer it will get still because sometimes it's still as easy to get off the course. But when you're over land, at any rate, um, you have somewhere to stop. The, the danger is when, when you're either pushing the boundaries of altitude or flying across the Atlantic, 14 people have died in the past year trying to accomplish what Captain Stoltz accomplished yesterday. So flying across the ocean, yes, is extremely dangerous. 